Hello, actually. Um, Gemma spent, a, she's got an unusual background for someone to come into learning, and she's, she spent the last eight years working in digital marketing, so she's really got an eye for this stuff, and um, doing online communications for the retail and fashion trade, and now she's at BP, um, helping people to perform, develop, and connect using video. And so she's going to share some of what she's been up to and also share you what it's like to have her job, in a way. She's a very lucky girl. So, uh, Gemma, hopefully... Uh, so, how are you all doing today? Good. Good? How have you found the sessions so far? Great. Great. Interesting. Some, some good comments. Um, well, I'm going to kind of share a bit of a secret about how my day's been so far. And it's been a bit of a nightmare. I'm not going to lie. Um, so, I woke up this morning to the horror that no one wants to find when they first wake up, and that was an empty milk carton in my fridge. So, being, um, being a Yorkshire girl, I thought there's no way that I can function today at learning technologies without a good cup of tea to start my day. So, I thought, right, I'm on a really tight schedule, I've got a train to catch, I've just got to get, get to learning technologies, can't be late, but thought, on the other hand, need a cup of tea. So I thought, right, if I time it right, I can just get down to the shop, get my milk, get back, get ready, get on the train, and everything will be fine. So went down to the shop. Ten-person queue out of the door of my local shop on Fairfield Road in East London. I don't know what was free with the paper or what the, whether someone was cashing lottery tickets in, but um, they, they, they were queuing. So finally got my milk, ran back to my flat, ran upstairs, made my cup of tea, got to how quickly changed, ready, Drank my tea, ready to face the day. So headed to the tube, Bow Road tube station. District line is normally pretty reliable. Not today. Severe delays in the district line. So I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? Um, can't get a taxi, too expensive. Can't ride a Boris bike. This dress doesn't really lend itself to athletic activity. Um, so I thought, right, I'll just have to jump on a bus. So quickly looked at my phone, next bus, two minutes. I thought, if I run there, if I just make it, I can, I can get on that bus and I'll be there in time. So I ran for the bus. Bus was just pulling away. I, I was kind of doing the, do I stop running and save face or carry on and make a fool of myself? Carried on and made a fool of myself, but I made the bus. Beeped my most card, got on the bus, sat down, and I'm here. And I will never go to bed with an empty milk carton in the fridge ever again. And um, you might kind of sit there and kind of think, well, this is about film and, and storytelling and social media. Why, why is she telling me about her, her cup of tea drama? Well, I just wanted to use that example as a way of illustrating the power of storytelling. So who was kind of with me as I was on that journey there? And who wanted to know, did I make the bus or didn't I make the bus? And who here will call in at the shop on the way home for a carton of milk? <laughs> You see, stories make learning stick with people. And that's what I'm trying to do in my role at BP. Um, so I, um, like Julie said, I'm Gemma Critchley. I've got a mar uh, marketing and digital communications background. I'm working in social media for brands like Monsoon Accessorize, um, First Direct, HSBC. And um, I recently joined BP about a year ago. And what I wanted to do was bring some of those content marketing and storytelling techniques that I was using into the learning space. Um, I felt that there's a real opportunity to make a big difference to the way that people consume information and to the way that people kind of connect with, um, with the, their organization and with their peers. And like Julie said, at BP, in our team, in the uh, learning, innovation, and technology team, we try to help people to uh, perform in their roles, to develop in their careers, and to connect with their peers across the organization. And for me, video is a really wonderful and powerful way of doing that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I do that today. Um, but first of all, just a real quick question. Um, does anyone have any views on what stories, social media, and film have in common? Any thoughts? An audience. An audience, good one. Anyone else? You say that again? <laughs> um, well, what, what I think, I mean, there's, there's loads of things they've got in common. Communication, audience is a good one. Um, what I think they've got in common is that they're all ways to help people connect with each other and they're all ways to make people feel things. So that they all have emotion attached to them. So you might remember the last time that a film perhaps made you cry or the last time you had a really great novel that you couldn't put down. 
Um, social media, you might not think kind of applies in that same way, but I bet you can remember the last time that you did this. So um, who's liked something today on Facebook? Yep, me too, quite a few times. Um, basically, from my marketing background, I, I know that a like can be considered a return on investment. So to that end, emotion is almost kind of a new way of measurement and a new kind of currency. Um, so I think as learning professionals, I think we can all learn something from the marketing industry about why that is so magic, why that emotion really helps someone to connect with a brand and compels them to buy something from that brand. Um, so thinking about that, wouldn't it be great if we could connect with our learners in that way and really um, make them feel something that made them connect with the message that we wanted to convey to them? Um, so I think to that end, we don't need a call to action anymore. I think we need a call to emotion. And um, the reason that I say this is that if we can make learners feel something, um, they are more likely to be able to recall that information that we've conveyed to them. Um, so I think if we can actually set out with an objective, this is what we want learners to feel. Some of you will remember the Mayor Angelou quote about uh, people will forget what you said and did, but they won't forget how you made them feel. I think that's directly applicable to learning and particularly in video for learning. So we really want to start making people feel like they've connected some way emotionally with what we're saying. And like Mark said, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a sob story. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have accountants crying <laughs> at their desk. That would be quite a bad thing, I think. Um, but I think if you can add humour in there, if you can um, maybe add some nuances that the kind of have the me too feeling to them. So uh, BuzzFeed do that quite a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with BuzzFeed, the kind of web news outlet. I use the word news loosely. It might be kind of 23 things only people from London know or 50 things people only from Yorkshire know. But if you use content marketing techniques like that in the films that you're making and in the way that you're connecting with your audience, um, I think it will really make that message stick. And so, I'm a big believer that storytelling is important for, um, for film and for social media and for learning. Um, and there's a little bit of science behind why that is important. Now, um, this is a theory called effective context. Has anyone here heard of effective context mentioned before? A couple of people. Cool. Um, so I am um, lucky enough to work with someone called Nick Shackleton-Jones that some of you might be familiar with. Um, so Nick has developed a way of explaining why storytelling makes learning stick with learners. And um, he's called it effective context. And essentially, effective, content, uh, sorry, effective context means that learning is the process by which people attach emotional or effective sense to information. Um, what that kind of means to me, kind of to break it down as a, a bit of a social media nerd, um, if I were to add a picture to Instagram, which I've done today already, I would add a tag to that, a hashtag. Um, so I'd just be appending something to that content that I'd produced. Same with YouTube. If I was going to upload a video to YouTube, I'd tag that video, make it easier for me to find at a later date. Um, this is really powerful in a learning context. If I, if I kind of give you an example. So if I were to ask you to tell me about the train journey that you had to work last Thursday, so you get the train to work every Thursday. Um, you could probably give me kind of a best approximation of what that journey felt like, about kind of what you did as a kind of cobbled together version of usual journeys. You might kind of say, yeah, I read the Metro and didn't get a seat or something like that. Um, but you probably wouldn't be able to recall the kind of real minute detail of that journey. Um, now, imagine on that train journey if a fight had broken out. Now, chances are that that fight would have made you feel something. So you might have felt scared. You might have been amused. If it might have been a slapstick kind of fight. Um, you might have been excited. You might have kind of thought, wow, something to brighten up my commute. Um, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> um, but the, the point there is that you would have felt something. So when I then said to you, tell me about your train journey into work last Thursday, chances are you would have a much better recollection of the minute detail of that journey than you would have um, had you not attached an emotion to it. Um, so I think it's, it's really powerful. It's also nothing new. Um, 
marketers and advertisers have been doing this for years. Um, I'm sure that you all remember our good friend Monty the Penguin from John Lewis at Christmas, um, tugging on our heartstrings. And also uh, Sainsbury's, I thought, did a, a wonderful job of kind of bringing emotion into their, into their video um, with the football, world war kind of analogy that they had going on there. Um, it's not just advertisers, it's not just learners. Um, the entertainment industry is doing it as well. So um, I don't know if we've got any Closet X Factor fans in, but they basically make <laughs> one there. <laughs> they basically make um, a sob story prerequisite to entry for that exact reason, so that you will remember the person who you're voting for because they've got a story behind them, and that's where stories become really powerful. Love Simon Cowell or hate Simon Cowell. Um, and you might wonder, kind of, what does this mean, kind of, in a a real world context then, how does, this, um, how does this apply? And that's what I want to kind of talk to you about today. So this is the hub. Um, this is kind of my baby at BP. So I am product manager for the hub. And um, this is our online video platform that we use for sharing video content across BP to help people perform, develop, and connect. And um, just to give you some kind of idea about the kind of things that we've got on there. So in terms of content, we've got everything from um, videos about leadership development um, through to real kind of hard technical stuff around um, how you avoid a gas explosion in a pipeline or how you um, optimize your drilling when you're out in the North Sea. Um, we've got things on there like how to use Microsoft Link, like really practical how-to tips. Um, and it's kind of built on the philosophies that are behind YouTube and TED Talks. Um, so the idea that with YouTube, you might go and search for a how-to video. For example, um, a few weeks ago, I was working from home and my washing machine decided to flood as I was kind of mid-conference call. I um, finished up the call and went, without looking for the manual or calling a plumber, I went straight to YouTube and Googled the make of washing machine and fixed it myself. The idea with the hub is that it's... It does just that. It delivers performance support. It delivers just-in-time learning. So um, people can go there at their point of need and find what they need when they need it. Um, so they're not going on a course six months before the washing machine breaks. They're actually finding a solution to it when it happens. There aren't actually any videos of washing machines on here. <laughs> um, so that might be all good and well, you might be thinking, but I, I guess where's the proof? And uh, just to share some numbers with you, so um, the hub is just under three years old. It'll be three in April. Um, there are almost 2,000 videos on there, which are a mix of content that we've created ourselves in-house, um, content that other people around the organization have created, so user-generated content, kind of harking back to what Mark said about getting your smartphone and getting out there. People are really starting to pick up on that now. And um, we've also recently, about in the last six months, started to bring in some externally curated content. So um, going out there to sites like TED Talks, like Big Thing, like Fast Company, um, like uh, contracts that we work with, like Halliburton, and looking at ways that we can bring in external knowledge, thought leadership, and industry knowledge into the hub so that it's there for our learners when they need it. So instead of them having to kind of go off and troll YouTube or troll various industry publications, it's right there for them. Um, so talking a little bit about kind of how we get people to engage with the hub. Now, this is really my sweet spot. So um, as I said before, I've got a, a background in marketing, and I think everything that I do in the learning space kind of harks back to that. And um, I've spent kind of most of my life being a signpost. So kind of stood there going, look at that. It's cool. Buy that in my kind of old marketing role. Um, it's no different to what we're doing at the Hub. We're using content marketing techniques to reach out and really engage with our users. And one way that we're doing that is by really listening to what they want. So we're listening to them in focus groups, in surveys. We're going out there on social media and um, asking the questions, what do you want to see on the Hub? And then we're using things like um, email newsletters, like uh, social media, to connect with them and to really pull them into the Hub and to kind of get them engaged. So um, we have seen a 40% uplift in the last year in terms of visits to the Hub. 
So um, again, to just quote, quote some numbers in terms of usage, um, we've had over half of the people in BP have actually been to the hub. So there's um, just a around about 80,000 people in BP and about 40,000 of them have actually been to the hub. 60% uh, of those are re repeat visitors. So they're people who've come to the hub, they've seen something they like, they've found it useful and they've come back again. Um, we know that people spend around five minutes on the site when they get there um, and they're watching more than one video. So most of the content on there is kind of between one and three minutes long. Um, so yeah, we are reaching out to people and using content marketing to really drive that uplift. So we've really seen a success in leaning on tools that people are already using. So things like Outlook, um, things like Link, things like our internal social network, which is Yammer. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Microsoft Yammer. <coughs> Um, but we're finding, whilst that's still in its early stages at BP, it's a really effective tool for kind of connecting with people and finding out what makes them tick. Which kind of leads me quite neatly onto my next point, actually, um, around how do you kind of build an army of storytellers? How do you get your organisation telling your stories for you? Because it's all good and well me kind of standing up here and saying, we've got 80,000 people to create content and we've got a dedicated team that does this. I know that in reality, a lot of people won't have that and you won't perhaps have the resource that BP has or, or you might not have kind of big budgets to build things. And that's the point that I really wanted to stress today. And it kind of ties in with what Mark was saying earlier, is that you don't have to spend money to make this happen. Um, most people will have their smartphones in their pockets um, I think it's all about enabling people and making them feel like they can, um, they can have a voice and making it easy for them to share things. And it's not even that you have to build a bespoke platform. The hub was built bespoke, um, but you could just as easily use YouTube or if you've got an internal social network like Yammer or something like that, go for it. I think um, there are tools out there. There's Vine. Um, I don't know if you... If, uh, if you've follow General Electric at all on Vine. I think they were the first brand on there and they do some amazing things on there. Um, so people are out there in big corporates doing this and using tools that are free, not having to pay a penny, um, shooting stuff on, on their smartphone and getting, getting little videos out there and really engaging with people. Um, and the other thing I would say as well is don't be kind of afraid to experiment with it. I think this is such a new space for everyone. I think some of the things that I do on the Hub, I kind of think, is that going to work? And I think all, the only way that you're going to find that out is by testing it and by trying it and just um, talking to your users, finding out if it's worked and making it a really iterative process. So just um, testing, learning and refining what you're doing. So um, part, a big part of that is speaking to your users and, and getting them infused and getting them involved. And I can actually see a couple of people now. I'm going to embarrass you now, Greg. Um, a guy who works at BP in our um, ITNS function we uh, he reached out to us about just said that it was interested in what we we're doing so we went along and chatted to him and now there are people in his team that are creating content for the hub so it's just as simple as that picking up the phone going to a face-to-face -face meeting and just being enthusiastic being passionate and um, showing people that it can really change the way that things are done especially in a, a, a cost conscious environment i know a lot of people will be facing kind of cost pressures so it's really good to be able to do things that are um light on budget but big on impact, so um, I would say give it a go, don't be scared, just pick up your smartphone and, and make some mistakes and learn from them. Um, and finally, the kind of, uh, I suppose, I guess the, the holy grail really, is, is it working? Does it make a difference to anyone? Um, it's all good and well as making beautiful content or kind of going out there and telling really compelling stories from people, but what if no one's watching it? What if no one's consuming it? And that was one of my biggest concerns when I took over from the Hub um, a year ago. Now, some really great work had been done around integrating Google Analytics into it. Again, that's a free tool that anyone can use um, just to help you to understand how people are um, engaging with your site. Um, so we could tell a, really lot, a, a lot of really great, great data about how people were get into the site, what they were doing when they were there in terms of their journey, but we didn't really know a huge amount about how they were interacting with the content. Um, so what we did was I worked with our development company called TUI Interactive, and they um, actually built a bespoke analytics dashboard for us, and that's really, really helped us to understand what content is important to our learners. Um, so we've been able to understand um, 
what kinds of things are they watching, what are they liking, what are they sharing, um, and really build our content strategy out of that. So we were previously focusing a lot of our energy in an area where actually those videos weren't really that well received, people weren't watching them. So now we've known we can shift our focus, we can make what we're doing more cost effective, we can save time, and we can just really, um, I guess, optimise what we're doing and make it really relevant for our audience, kind of going back again to your point about being relevant and being authentic in what you're doing. Um, so, so far, there's a, there's a really good uptake on the Hub. I'm really pleased with, with uh, the way that it's going. I think there's a lot of work to do. I mentioned before, half of the people in BP have been to the Hub, but of course, we all know that means half the people in BP haven't been to the Hub. Um, so I've got my work cut out for me, I think, in terms of content marketing. Um, but I think as long as we can kind of keep telling those really compelling stories and really engaging people, I think um, that storytelling magic kind of does really help learning to stick with learners. And it, it's a really compelling way of doing it as well. So it's a really good way to connect people across the organisation. So you might have a team that's split between um, Sao Paulo and London, for example. You might even have a team that's split between, I don't know, Grimsby and Hull, uh, but they're still not in the same building. So use video to bring people together and make them feel like they're part of the same team. Um, one of BP's core values is one team, and it's something that's really important to me as well. Um, to kind of feel that we're all part of the same organisation. And I hope that the Hub is kind of doing that job and bringing people together and helping to share stories um, and connect peers. Um, so I just wanted to show an example of this in action and to um, share with you a story about some filming that I did last year. Um, went out to our biofuels business, which is based in Brazil, in central Brazil. And um, it's a very rural area, it's a very agricultural business. Um, so there was a challenge that we had there around leadership development and how we really um, made our leaders stronger in terms of um, bringing the BP values to life, leading through our values and really kind of getting everyone to work together as that one team that I mentioned earlier. Um, now there was a big challenge on our hands. So um, BP had recently bought a lot of these kind of smaller maybe family-run farms, and um, they transitioned into being big corporate entities. And there was a, a real cultural problem around kind of leadership and respect, i.e. There, there wasn't really that much leadership and there wasn't a great deal of respect in the business. So um, I was approached to ask how we might be able to help with that. And so um, I asked a few questions around what were the challenges. And one of the challenges were that there was quite a low level of literacy in terms of the kind of the operational workforce. Um, so straight away I thought video would be a wonderful way to be able to connect with them on a real human personal level um, and to show them their peers kind of leading by example and really role modeling those values. So um, I won't kind of bore you any longer. I will show you kind of what we, what we achieved over there. Um, and yeah, it would be great to get your thoughts. Um líder deve conhecer a sua equipe, um líder deve conhecer as pessoas que trabalham com ele, um líder deve conhecer os problemas que essas pessoas têm. Um bom líder é aquele que, uma vez que ele define quais atividades têm que ser feitas, ou, enfim, quais tarefas, ele deixa com que as pessoas executem essas atividades, ele não fica o tempo inteiro desconfortável. Um líder tem que gostar da sua equipe e vice-versa também, a sua equipe tem que gostar do líder, né? Esse elo de confiança é muito importante. Um líder, primeiramente o um líder tem que ser humilde, humildade. Eu acho que humildade a gente conquista as pessoas. A sua equipe e ajuda tanto a desenvolver como a motivá-la, né? como ser uma pessoa melhor, tanto para a empresa quanto para a vida pessoal também. Eu me chamo Gisele Miranda Costa, sou líder de suporte agrícola na BP Biocombustível há sete anos e meio. Eu comecei como lavrador no corte de cana manual. Agora eu cuido de mil pessoas aqui na BP. Quando eu peguei a minha primeira turma, assim, cara, eu fiquei louca, né? Eu chorei, eu sonhei. Todas, né? A primeira líder mulher do grupo instalado aqui no Brasil. Esse é um grande desafio. 
ser a primeira mulher e assim, aonde era uma redoma só de masculina, de homens, e eu chegar e mostrar o meu valor, quem era eu. E assim, eu vi meus filhos falar que tem orgulho cada vez que eu... É muito bom. Muito bom mesmo. Tem um mundo muito masculino. E a gente sai de algo assim. Eu fiz sério. Ficar junto com o gerente, coordenando, administrando, é... Não tem palavra. Que vergonha. E eu sou durona, hein? Ele agia com muita transparência, verdade, coragem, respeito. Ele era um guerreiro, era um homem especial. Muito do que eu sou hoje, eu me espelho sempre nele. E ele já faleceu tem 15 anos. E até hoje eu lembro dele em qualquer ato meu, em qualquer decisão. Os mil que me ligam, os mil que eu atendo todo, quase que diariamente, no rotina, 24 horas, é com todo carinho, com amor, com respeito, como se fosse eu. Isso aqui é minha vida, é 24 horas. Assim aqui é minha segunda casa, ou mais minha casa do que minha casa. Eu amo isso aqui. É incomparável. Tem distinção. A minha entrega é inteira para BP. So that was just an example of the kinds of films that we're producing at BP. And that's everything from me. I hope you've kind of had something that you can take away, maybe take back to your organisation. And if you do have any questions, I'd love to answer them now or feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you don't want to ask a question now. More than happy to kind of meet up for a chat afterwards. Thank yeah, you. That's great. Thank you, Gemma. My pleasure. I think, first of all, if we could just ask if anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Gemma about what she's shared with us this afternoon. Yeah, a couple there. Should take the gentleman first at the back. Yeah, Gemma, um, where, where your um, employees uh, are uploading videos mm -hmm. to your, your hub, how do you make sure that the content is acceptable to BP? Very good question. Um, so at the moment, the way that it works is that we have um, a site editor, a managing site editor, who's here in the audience today, Sonia Talbot. Um, so Sonia um, looks after all the content, so it all comes through her, and she would approve all of that. Um, so we have different levels of admin access on the hub. So we have a user level, which is everyone, um, an admin, which can upload content but not publish, and then a super admin, which can publish content. Now, I'm working towards a point where we have an agreement with legal where people can upload and publish their own content because I think that is the most open and transparent way and that's when it will really kind of ignite people's imagination when they have that control. Um, as of yet, I'm still kind of working my way through that, that process, but um, if, if anyone else has kind of tested that, I would love to hear about it, so reach out. Okay. Um, lady in the red top there. Can we just get a microphone to you, sorry. Hi, Gemma. I'm, just, I'm interested with regards to the hub, how you reach out to all age groups. I work in a ageing demographics where I work and there's a lot of challenges engaging that, that older population with anything relating to social media. So I'm interested to know what you do to, to combat that, if that's something that you come across. Thank you. Um, yeah, that is, that is something that we, we come up against at BP quite a lot because um, we have, a, I guess, a similar challenge to what a lot of people have is that a lot of the workforce is kind of from that baby boomer generation um, and the kind of the younger crowd still hasn't quite joined us yet so um, I think what it's important to do is understand where people are spending their time in your organisation so if people spend all of their time in Outlook if their lives are kind of planned through their calendar and planned through their emails contact them in that way and reach out to them that way um, another thing that I found to be really effective with people who perhaps they're not backed from social media and they don't quite get the concept of 
a video or why, why it would be useful for them. Um, it's just to do a face-to-face -face or a, a link call and to show it to them and actually demonstrate it. So quite a lot of my time is spent in kind of visiting other people's team meetings and town halls and talking about what we do. Um, and I think the more we kind of demonstrate it and show where it could really add value to people. And I think, again, that goes back to making sure that the content's really relevant and understanding what would help those more senior members of, of the community at your workplace um, and creating content around that. I think when they start to see that value demonstrated, then that really comes to life for them. Does that answer your question? Cool. Thank you. Hi. Um, We've got this lady here. Yeah. Next. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I watched the last uh, video you showed, and, and it looks like it's a professional filmer. So I was, I was wondering if you have some policies, uh, and how do you work with professional filmers versus, uh, let's say, what we call the beauty of imp imperfection? Thank you. Um, yeah, really good question. We, we do a mix of both at BP, so some of it we shoot ourselves, and uh, we do that either on a digital camera or an iPhone. Um, some of it we will work with um, a company on BP's preferred supplier list. So we have a group of 12 companies that BP have, they've gone through a tender process with BP and they're kind of authorised and, and able to work with BP in that way. Um, so the company we worked on with this film was called Plastic Pictures. Um, this w actually was shot on a, a Canon digital camera, so a, a DSLR, and um, also shot on my iPhone out of the back of a van. Um, you might have noticed the, the shot when you, you're kind of going through the corn. Um, so I think it, it's good to look at ways of mixing it up and doing it in different ways. But I think if you're going to work with a third party company, I'd say um, take a look at a few showreels, speak to different people and not only get a feel for what they do from an aesthetic point of view, but also how they work and whether that fits in with kind of your ethos. I quite like DIY and getting involved and being quite frontline with what I'm doing. And um, so it was really important to me to find a company that could work in that way for me. Does that help? Yeah, and I also wonder how, how do you decide when a, a story is good? Professional? Um, I guess it depends on a lot of different factors, actually. I, I suppose one of them, which I'm sure everyone comes up, up against, is budget. So um, who's asking for the film, which area of the business is the request coming from? Because a lot of the time, people will come to us and say, we've got a really great story to share. Can you help us to tell it? Um, and then we might have a, co a conversation around, do you have any budget to do this professionally or can we set something up to perhaps save costs and do that internally? So I think it definitely has to be on a case-by-case -case basis and just kind of understanding what it will be used for and, and why. Thank you. Craig. Hi, Gemma. Um, I've got a question that might be a little unfair to ask because of your time at BP versus how long the hub has been around. But okay. I guess tapping into your expertise around content marketing, mm -hmm. In terms of the, the long-term success of a platform, soft launch versus a big bang launch, do you have any experiences to what guarantees, as much as you ever can, a longer-term success? Yes, I, well, I've got an idea and kind of my own personal philosophy. I definitely wouldn't say it was hard science, but for me, um, it's all about being really iterative with what you're doing and constantly evolving the platform. So um, the hub is now in its third iteration. It's gone through... Uh, kind of several redesigns and tweaks and that's all based on user feedback all based on doing user testing kind of eye tracking um, we have held sessions i think it was november last year where we set up a camera in a room and watched users use the hub and kind of set them tasks to do to understand how they were using it um, and just constantly refining what we're doing to be as, as good as we can be really looking at what content's driving people looking at are there bits of the site that aren't getting used at all if so why are they there and just constantly um, moving it on and changing it. I don't know if that is that. Was that answer? done during the, the pre launch phase? Was that which would suggest a softer launch no, or was it no. a big bang launch? Um, it's, it's, it's pre and post launch. So um, we're currently just as a little bit of insider info, we're just in the process of redesigning the hub at the moment. Um, so it will never stop changing and stop evolving. And um, you, see, you see it in other kind of big tech companies. Google and Facebook is a good example. Whenever Facebook changes something, someone starts a group saying, <laughs> boycott Facebook, bring, bring back the old Facebook, but you then soon realise you, you forget what the old Facebook was like and you're happily using this in a, perhaps more than you were before because they've made the user experience better. So I think it's all about constantly learning from what you're doing and how you're used to using the platform and it, being really iterative with your process and keeping things moving, keeping things changing. 
Thanks, yeah, never, never stand still, never a dull moment. <laughs> Good question, thank you. Okay, I mean, obviously, um, if we open it up for questions, any additional questions you've got for Mark, um, it just occurred to me that after both of these presentations, and there's been a lot of questions about, you know, video quality and actually how you video. Mark is actually filming here at the moment. Some of you may have seen him doing that. And today and all of tomorrow, he's going to be taking videos. So if you wanted to go and see it being done um, for yourself, you're going to be roughly in uh, conference room conference five. Outside conference room five, yeah. yeah. Or you could tweet Mark at, at C Learning. Um, and uh, he'll tell you where he is and who he's interviewing, hopefully. Or if you want to do something to give back UK, go and speak to Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> She's here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll drag you in front of the camera. <laughs> OK, are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Lady at the back. Lady at the back in a very lovely top. Uh, it's probably a question that both of you, or either of you, um, could answer. Um, Gemma, though, you, you said you, that you'd got um, kind of in-house custom-created content, user-generated content, and you were bringing in external content, um, and that you'd got a, a bespoke dashboard that was, was analysing that in terms of what users preferred. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to both of you is, what, what do users prefer? And, and that links to what works in terms of change behaviour. I think you can. Shall I give mine so you maybe jump in if you want to? <laughs> um, I think there isn't an, an easy and quick answer to that because it does change depending on, I guess, what people's focus is. Um, so, for example, um, we did some videos with our finance university at BP when they were going through a very specific change. And so those videos were amongst the most popular content on the hub at that time. Um, but as a kind of a general rule, you do find the content that tends to be consumed more and get shared and liked and talked about on platforms like Yammer um, does tend to be the more emotive content. So we've actually got videos of our really senior leaders, so right up to um, board level, talking about really personal experiences to them. So things like when they first joined BP, how that felt, um, mistakes they've made in their career and how they've learned from them. And it tends to be that kind of content that gets people really engaged. I mean, on the other hand, things like how to set up a link call, how to find out your link phone number, just equally as possible because they're really practical. Um, so I think it's just different levels depending on the users. I think it's important, kind of going back to Craig's point before, is to kind of keep listening to your users and, and understanding what it is, because it will change over time. Does that help? Cool. And yeah, I think the, um, I totally agree, it's the emotive stuff. I mean, I, I'm in a different place because I tend to go into organisations, create the content for them and then go, whereas Gemma gets to sort of see the sort of, the whole picture. But um, the, the feedback that I've always, the, the good feedback I've always seen is like when you know, it's been the emotive stuff, or it's been the humour. And it's, like you said, it's about, you know, dropping the, the authoritarian stuff, you know, you know, taking the CEO and just putting it on the same level as everybody else, you know, mm -hmm. telling those intimate stories. And I think, I, I, kind of, I forgot to mention it earlier on, but I think, you know, it's that idea of holding up a mirror to the organisation. And in that, it's a celebration. It celebrates what people, it celebrates the experts in your organisation. And that's what we're talking about, actors. What, you know, in terms, in terms of what works, there's the same question, what doesn't work? What, what kind of falls flat? And that is the actor-based stuff. Because, and I've never understood, like, if, you're, if you've got core learning content and you've got the experts in your organisation, why would you have somebody who doesn't know, somebody who's acting, to deliver it? You would never get an actor to go into a classroom and, you know, deliver learning in, in a teaching capacity. So why does it happen in video? And, it's, um, and it can make it cheesy. That's not to say actors aren't they're not good to use, they can be great to illustrate things and things like that, but the experts are in your organisation. And when you do that, when you bring them in, it's like saying, you know, we really value what you've got to say, we really value, you know, what you can, how you can help others develop. And that is like such a huge thing for them. And it says a lot about how you view the em your employees. And so that kind of thing works really, it's really, really p powerful. So I hope that helps. <laughs> We're absolutely out of time, so um, um, I just like I have to tell you something very important. Um, if you want to go and see Steve Wheeler signing his books, he's outside uh, conference rooms four and five in this break. For any of you want to go and do that, the book's called Loving with Ease. <laughs>
Okay. But apart from that, I would like to thank you all so much for being so warm and helpful to Gemma and Mark. And I'd like to thank Gemma and Mark for two fantastic presentations. Thank you.